made a few years ago by the Japanese. And those density fluctuations, which we were talking about a moment ago, are doing their thing. Pulling in matter, an interesting pattern, a filamentary pattern, which is the signature of cold dark matter topology. It's density fluctuations causing stringy filaments. Matter falls into the filament, drains along the filaments into the nodes, and that's where galaxies and later clusters of galaxies form. What we're watching here in this video is gas, which is the pale blue substance, turning into stars, which are the small, dense points of light. And at about this stage, the universe is 3 billion years old. Today, it's 14 billion years old. And what we take away from this simulation is the fact that this early phase of galaxy formation is extremely chaotic. Merging is rapid in the early universe. And matter falls into uh, clumps, and then the clumps cluster to make yet larger clumps. And this is how our Milky Way grew in size. When the clumps collide, all pre-existing stars are thrown into a spheroidal halo around the galaxy, and any remaining gas settles into a flattened rotating disk. So from a video like this, we predict that galaxies today should consist of two different structures, actually three, a halo of old stars, a flattened disk comprised of gas, and the stars that have formed in the disk after, uh, since the last major collision. And we know that this is correct because when we actually look at pictures of galaxies, these are the morphologies we see. We see the patterns repeated in real galaxies that are predicted in simulations like the one we saw. Disks of gas permeated by stars seen at different angles, sometimes edge-on like this one, sometimes face-on. And a characteristic feature, which is very, very important, is this band of dust that you can see in all mature, large galaxies when seen edge on. Those are interstellar dust grains that are produced in the atmospheres of stars and supernovae, blown out into interstellar space. They're remarkably like cigarette smoke. Individually insignificant, but in large numbers, highly opaque, forming this dust absorbing, uh, light absorbing layer along with the gas in the plane of the galaxy. This allows us, with wide-angle photographs, to establish instantly that our Milky Way is exactly the same kind of beast. There is the dust plane visible in our Milky Way in this wide-angle photograph. This dust is interesting because it is the stuff of plants. Without this dust, we don't have rocks. Without rocks, we don't have Earths. When we look up and see the dark dust rings silhouetted against the light of galaxies, we are looking at the material of the future solar system. Further proof comes from pictures like this, the Hubble Space Telescope, ultra deep field, looking at the forms of galaxies visible in this picture. This is the deepest picture ever taken by humankind at least the deepest unclassified picture. Two weeks on Hubble cost $20 million. 10,000 galaxies visible in this small field of view. How big is this field of view? 1% of the size of the moon. So 10,000 galaxies in this picture over the whole sky, 100 billion galaxies visible. Perhaps you're beginning to think that our Milky Way and we are insignificant. Perhaps you're thinking of this despair poster, astronomy, finding out you really just don't matter. That would be the wrong message to take from my talk. That's exactly the wrong conclusion. So I need to speak more, I need to say more about our origins before you'll understand that this, that this poster, by the way, which I invented, 
<laughs> not Miss Bear. Much as I love that company. <laughs> Uh, before you, you, I don't want to leave you with this message. I, I, I want to move on. So let's move on to further chapters in our history of the origins of humankind. We form the galaxy now, and the galaxy is full of gas, which is ready and able to make further stars and solar systems. The new stars form from dense clouds of gas, like this one here in the neighboring galaxy. This is a picture of it, as taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And there's a cluster of stars visible at the middle of this picture. They are young stars. They're very hot. They're putting out ultraviolet light. And their light is energizing and exciting the surrounding clouds of gas. We see this process happening all over our own galaxy. And some of the most beautiful pictures, like this one, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, show this process. A very young cluster of stars lighting up, sending its radiation out into the neighboring neighborhood, and ionizing and exciting the surrounding gas, the birth clouds of these stars, and causing them to glow. Here's another one. I think this is my favorite all-time couple picture. But the new cluster is visible at the top. These clusters send out rains of photon, which impinge on the birth clouds, much like rain falls on Bryce Canyon in the American Southwest, sculpting and eroding the columns of gas and leaving pillars like this one, and finally one star peeking out, recently become visible at the bottom of the picture, having a uh, expanded its own cavity, and uh, it's, it, it's almost like a jack-o'-lantern on cavity, visible through the hole. Actually, the most useful region to study this process is closer to home. It's a region that we can see with our naked eye. It's the sword in the constellation Orion. This is the Orion Nebula. And we can blow it up thanks to the extraordinary resolving power of the Hubble telescope, zooming in a total of a factor of 100. And as we do so, structures become visible, silhouetted against the glowing gas clouds behind. There are about 50 of these structures in Orion. Here's a sample of four, which are thought to be at the early stages of star and solar system formation. So this is, these are solar systems just beginning to form. The material of their stars has just coagulated, hasn't all fallen in yet, and any residual material still surrounding them in sort of a cocoon has been ionized and excited by the light of those very big neighboring hot stars. Later in the process, these structures look like this. The material has settled to a disk, and at the middle of these disks, you can see individual stars that are visible. The disk by now is small and dense, a crisp silhouette against the background glowing clouds. And we know they're disks because sometimes we see them edge on, as in this case. And so this is a solar system, a coral solar system in formation, about 17 times as large as Pluto's orbit. And that's just about the right size to make the Oort cloud of comets in our own solar system. So this has been a wonderful laboratory for studying star formation. Now, seeing evidence of stars and solar systems forming like this inspires us to go out and find evidence for planets around other stars. This is hard. This is hard because planets don't, in general, shine by their own light. They're rather small mass, and they're rather dim. But there is a technique for finding them called the Doppler technique, which was pioneered here at my very own observatory, Lick Observatory. In fact, the workers there and at Keck have discovered over half of all the external solar systems that have yet been discovered. And this is an example of one of their first finds. It's typical, in its way, of the early discoveries. 
conclusion is that this is a solar system completely unlike ours. This is a very massive planet called a hot Jupiter. It's very close to its parent star. Its year is only four days long. It is skimming the surface of this star, whizzing around it with a very, very short period. So that's one of the findings of these explorations looking for new planets around other stars. And the other finding is that when we can study multiple systems with multiple planets in them, we find that they are radically different from our own solar system in one very, very important respect. And that is the fact that their orbits are typically quite elongated. And this is dangerous. This is extremely dangerous. Picture a solar system in which the orbits are elongated. That means that the sphere of influence of every planet is broadened. Sometimes it's affecting planets near its periastron, sometimes near apoastron. This tends to drive solar systems unstable. Laplace asked this question two years, 200 years ago. He asked whether or not our solar system was permanently stable. In another investigation that was carried out here at UC Santa Cruz in a senior thesis, the student and our professor Greg Laughlin integrated the orbits of planets in our solar system to establish a very, very important fact. And that fact is that our solar system is quite stable. Perhaps not permanently stable, but stable long enough, with at least a billion years of stability to go. From what we see about solar systems around other planets, this is unusual. So that is one of the morals that I want to drive home to you tonight. And, and that is that it's not that easy to make a solar system. It's easy to make a galaxy. I think our galaxy is one of them. Very typical for a galaxy of its type. Our sun is typical for a star of its type. But our solar system may be incredibly unusual. So let's think about this. Let's, let's try to take away some lessons from cosmology. Lesson number one, I told you a story. It's all backed up by hard evidence. The conclusion is that we got here according to the laws of physics. We are subject to those laws, and we must live within them. The end of magical thinking. Lesson number two, our solar system is rare in having planets that are well separated and on circular orbits. It is exceptionally stable with a future lifetime of at least one million years. Lesson number three, the sun itself has a billion years of useful life to human. In other words, to sum up, our species has been given the precious gift of cosmic time. I can't emphasize how lucky we are. If you run through the history of the formation of our galaxy, the Earth, the solar system, life on Earth, at every juncture, our particular, our particular uh, neighborhood here formed as early as possible with the result that our sun is only middle-aged and we have a lot of time to go. We have to solve a couple problems. We have to figure out the asteroid impact problem. But I'm confident that with determined effort, we can solve that problem. In other words, we have a billion years at our disposal. And the question I want to pose to you is, what are we going to do with now, you would say, maybe, no problem. But I see a big problem. What is the problem? Well, first of all, we are the first human beings to know these things. That's, that's an important thing. We are the first human beings to have this knowledge and the responsibility that comes with it. So what is the problem? The problem is 
growth. I've now become attuned to listening to the news, to reading the Wall Street Journal, and over and over I, I hear the refrain that we need to get into a state of uh, something like three or three and a half percent growth. That was the old standard that held throughout the first part of the 20th century. And somehow, this is a great, this is the great swindle. This is portrayed as steady state. This is portrayed as normal. Now, you all know that if something is growing at three and a half percent per year, it is growing exponentially. That's not a steady state. So let's investigate that. Assume a three and a half percent growth rate every year. How long does it take for something or other like that to double? Well, it takes 20 years. Sounds good. After 20 years, your economy is twice as big, twice as much stuff. What's to complain about? 40 years, you got four times as much stuff. Hmm, human lifetime, 80 years, 16 times as much stuff. And of course, all of that stuff is making its demands on the planet, right? You know, this, the cadmium, the rare earths and all of that are coming out at 16 times the rate when you die as when you were born. That is, that's simply not sustainable. So what's the miracle of compound interest over cosmic time? Let's do the math. Three and a half percent growth every year for a billion years. Now the, now the, the, the cosmologist is talking to you. What happens? OK, it's 10 with 13 million zeros after it. Well, there's no number for that. I, I, I won't even try to read it. OK. So let's turn it around. What is sustainable growth on cosmic time? Supposing we allow ourselves a factor of two growth over a billion years. This is the annual growth rate per year, effectively zero. Okay, so no net increase in resource use and waste reduced to levels that can be completely naturally recycled. That is cosmic sustainability. All of this stuff about sustainable growth is bullshit. Absolute bullshit. I, 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 I'm completely mystified at how intelligent people could sit at a conference and think about light bulbs when in fact this is the conundrum that we're actually faced with. I think about timescales of billions of years. I'm also a citizen. 
Now, finally, the citizen and the cosmologist are warring within the same body. They are trying very hard to coexist in the same brain and have not completely succeeded. So I really don't know what our, our future is going to look like, um, but I think it's going to be very different from what we're assuming now. Now, you're probably, you may be thinking, Malthus, right? Malthus said these things 200 years ago. I would say I'm, I sort of agree with Malthus, but with a slight difference. Malthus emphasized population and population growth. That's not so much our problem now. I suspect that population growth will come under control. It's coming under control in many of the major countries. The problem is consumption growth. And the problem is GNP growth, which can occur for the fixed number of people. And that, in some sense, is more fundamental to our way of life here in Western democracies than the number of people in the country. OK, so looking forward, what do we have to do? I mean, how would you design a world in which there was to be no increase in consumption resources and perfectly so? We actually had a world like this. We had a world like this for thousands of years. If you look at the number of people, uh, even after agriculture was invented, up until about 4,000 BC, the population was rather constant. And it's probable that they had constant consumption. Around 4,000 BC, things changed. The population began to grow. That's a signal, probably, that those people were consuming more per capita. Do you know what happened in 4,000 BC? Bet you don't know. We domesticated the horse. That was the first instance of extra energy beyond what the human body can produce. Population grew in an exponential way for another thousands of years until about 200 years ago, at which point we entered a new exponential growth curve. And what happened 200 years ago? This one we know. Coal. Coal followed by that, right? So there is some indication that population growth historically has favored, has followed the amount of energy that's available to an individual person to consume. Now, for the last 200 years, especially, We found in an economic system that is predicated on this kind of growth. But more than that, I think our minds have come to depend on it. What do I mean by that? I think in addition to becoming addicted to growth, we become addicted to novelty. Because the great thing that more gives you tomorrow is the ability to do more and to discover more. It's no accident that we're building these telescopes to tell us about the cosmos at the very point where our consumption of natural resources is at its peak. This is when we actually have the power to do science at the level we're going to do. And if we were to consume less, how would we advance? How would we advance knowledge? How would we advance culture? This I think, is the central problem that is facing the human race. There's a book which I admire greatly called Coming of Age in the Milky Way. Tim Ferriss, a wonderfully gifted science writer. It's a book about becoming cosmically aware and mature in the Milky Way. I like that idea. What I want to pair with that is that this is the moment at which we need to become self-aware. Not only are we cosmically aware, but are self-aware so that we understand how we fit with the universe and what it takes to be a successful species here. How can astronomy help besides posing the problem? Well, first of all, we need to get people's attention on this matter. And we've got a great story. We have the greatest story of any of the sciences. I mean, who could be super light expansion and, and inflation and you know, light years of space, etc. Supernova, whatever. Okay. 
The biologist may figure out life, but it will never be inspiring. It will always be chemistry and slime. <laughs> the astronomers actually have the great story to tell, the inspiring story to tell. So we need, we need to inspire. We need to tell our story and use it for inspiration. Another thing we do is we take great pictures, iconic pictures. This is one that you recognize from Apollo 13. We've taken pictures of the Earth from an even larger distance. Okay, this one taken from the vicinity of the moon. This is not the most distant picture of the Earth, though, that we've ever taken. This is the most distant picture of the Earth. Now, obviously, it's not. The big, the big body here is not Earth, it's Saturn. A picture of Saturn that no human being has ever seen. The Cassini mission went to Saturn, flew around the backside, and took a picture looking back to the sun. And absolutely dropped it for this picture. One of the most beautiful ever taken by our species. But tonight, this is not a picture of Saturn. It is a picture of the Earth. The Earth is in this picture. Can you see it? I'll give you a little help. It's that dot here in the middle. So that's the third thing that astronomers can do. They can put us in perspective in space and time. The nearest help is very far away. We are on our own. We have the prospect of a billion years. What are we going to do with it? If there is any question that is more important for our human species, I don't know what it is. And it's the one that astronomy presents to us in space. Thank you. So maybe we can have some discussion of that and how the, the thesis, if it is valid at all, could be better presented. <laughs> yes? So is the goal for the human species to survive until either the sun explodes or the solar system becomes dynamically unstable and the planet is no longer inhabitable? Or I think you put it very... Did you repeat the question? Okay, the question is, I'm going to shorten it a little bit. Um, what is the goal of the human species? Is it to survive and wait until the sun explodes or go somewhere else or what? Okay. I think you asked you rephrase the very core of my talk. What is life about if not values? What are we about on this planet if not values? Answering that question is, would answer the values that we have as a species that go beyond just my values as an individual body here to survive and get through you know, 80 years of life or something like that. So I, I don't know the answer to that. I might have my views, but unless we as a species can coalesce around some values like that, I'm quite worried that we won't get through the next 100 or 200 years. No. No, what, what, you meant, what you said about we're the first, we're, we're answering these questions for the first time. You know, so we're presented with this knowledge of what to do with it for the first time. You know, and, and by that token, we're the first species in, in the history of life on this planet to actually um, have to consider doing with less than, than wanting to get more. You know, but life life is about sustainability, but it, it's not it's not for because you're trying to protect yourself. You're, you're always eating out more. Someone else is just maybe eating, doing it better than you are, and so you know. For us to look around and say, oh, you know, we can't grow anymore, is a really big philosophical question. Yes. That's, that's, that goes against nature of everything. I think what you're saying is that species have succeeded on Earth by always wanting more. And it's just that throughout most of cosmic time on Earth, you couldn't get it. And we're the first people or species who've actually succeeded in getting it. And so the age old. Or if you couldn't get it, you would go away. Yeah, exactly. Right. We, have, we may or may not have succeeded, but we're at least aware that, oh my gosh, we have a problem. 
we oh, can. Oh, maybe in the same sense. Yeah. Why do we think why is people different than exactly. all the other species? Right. I think he's saying we that we aren't. Right. Well, I think I that that's that's fair enough to say, but at least you know they weren't looking back at the age of the universe, you know, and knowing that we have a billion years left, you know, to, to do something with this problem that is finite. You know, to, to another species, it's not a finite problem. It's, you know, you, you just do it until it's over. Um, so I, I, I think it, it's great and valid point, but it's 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 really big. It's, it's really big. big. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to take issue with the chemistry slide. <laughs> 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 Report from chemical and engineering news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm sure you made it that way, but you know, chemistry is. It was it was a cheap lab. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but uh, chemistry. since he presented these messages. And does that discourage you, or how would you react? Are you trying to do, do you think things need to be done differently? Oh, I definitely think things need to be done differently. I mean, in terms of the presentation of the message oh. that Sagan did, and why, in your view, didn't it have the impact? I think he tried out very similar themes. Really, I don't see that he tried out these things. Perhaps I should have listened harder. I think he told the story, but I don't think he talked about the implications. Well, and I don't think he talked about human nature. And well, that in the section here, he was no, certainly part of it. And the big issue that he's talking about in 13 points about the future was avoiding nuclear war. Uh, he worked out the nuclear winter scenario, which was in case there was a nuclear war, it could be so much darkness uh, in the sky that uh, the Earth would be plunged into an ice age, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't, you know, a crucial thing to appreciate is that although the program was named Cosmos, he didn't know beans about the cosmos except that there was the cosmic background radiation. Everything else that we discovered was discovered after that program was made. Dark energy, dark matter, there was nothing that was dark matter. That's largely irrelevant. Well, no. 3%. Well, 1.03 raised to an appropriate power. He knew that. He knew. But that period think. of time, that, that the pictures that you show launched the environment. You know, so I think yeah. I think astronomy, to a large extent, has kicked off this idea. I mean, looking at ourselves, you know, as a dot in space, definitely kicked off, you know, a whole generation of environmentalists. Spaceship Earth. Yeah. The blue belt. Well, I think this kind of piggybacks on the Carl Sagan comment, but also to your talk, and, and I'm not sure quite how to pitch this, but I, I study anthropology, and so our question is, what is anthropos? And our answer is that's historically changing all the time. And so I think in terms of what does astronomy have to teach the human, I would want to know who is the human to astronomy, and sort of there are multiple ways to be human and, and sort of not not taking the human as a monolith or as human nature or as a, a biologically defined entity, but as something, you know, really evolving in complicated ways, you know, and human machine interfaces and that values that define the human are themselves really historically shifting and multiple right now. And so what do maybe what's what do we want to emphasize or what different kinds of ways of being human are there right now, which ones are severely degraded and which ones are flourishing or this kind of thing. Does that make sense? And I think for me, Sagan had a very monolithic view of what human is. Could you try to phrase a question in one sentence? Because I haven't quite gotten to it. I would say 
so you said, you know, what does astronomy have to teach humans? And my question is, who is the human to astronomers, specifically, specific astronomers? You, you seem to think that this is a complicated thing. I don't see it as so complicated, so you need uh -huh. to teach me a little bit on why it's so so. See, I, I can see that there are two kinds of humans. One, one kind of human is barely existing and is very worried about feeding their children and getting enough to eat. And I really don't think that that kind of human is receptive to thoughts like this. The thoughts like this are a luxury to a person like that. Another kind of human is more like we are here in this room in, in the sense that we've satisfied our basic needs and we have the resources to think about larger questions. So since it's people like that who have tended historically to govern the course of history, I think raising those questions and addressing them to people like that is not a miss. I'm very well aware that there are lots of people who would be who would think this is completely irrelevant. I think that there are, I mean, for me, that two kinds of people, it maybe is a little bit narrow. But I think there are a lot of people who are, needs are satisfied, but they have ideologies or beliefs that like that just to be larger questions. And you mentioned economics, and I think that's a huge driver of some of these questions about the idea of perpetual resources and, you know, markets will drive availability of metals. When it gets harder to find them, they get more valuable. We'll just get them from deeper in the earth, and we'll get asteroids or something else. And that's a mindset that a lot of people, I think, were very educated and aware of and share. So I wonder how you bring this message to people in a way that doesn't seem to be preachy or, or you know, dystopian in some way that can appeal to people from, of all political ideologies or, or walks of life who may share. You know, we have a common heritage, but they have different ideas about how to go about it. How do, yeah. you, how do you broaden this message? That's a great question. So I, I think that's a question for the room. It's not a question for me. Yeah, and I think in some ways, you know, one of the things that this is cool is that we're all kind of a similar mind, I think, of some of these things. So in a way, we're preaching to the choir. But how, how do we boil this down in a way that appeals to a wider audience? There are a lot of hands. I'll just say one very short thing. I think there is an example in history in which a people have deliberately denied themselves. And I have in mind the Chinese who have told themselves that they will only have one child. Now, I've, not, I've been emphasizing um, not population, but consumption. But if you can limit yourself to one child, you can probably limit yourself in other ways that have to do with consumption. So I think it is possible for, under the right circumstances, and I'm not quite sure what those circumstances are, for large masses of people to um, step back and do and consume less. But that was the Chinese government, not the Chinese people who made that decision. But the Chinese are not succeeding to time consumption. That's what you're saying. Uh, all of that, all of the above is true. But, but I think that democracy is not, that's not the governing <laughs> structure of the future, that's for sure. I'm pretty confident in that. Oh, that's a big statement. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, um, you know, Tom Murphy and I have go along with the same ideas. It's remarkable. He has a blog called Do the Math. He's thought very carefully about a lot of these issues. And we've been meeting with economists and stuff like that. The very thing I was thinking was a good idea. And we, what we discovered talking about UCSD is that in fact they do believe in infinite growth, almost all of them. And they have this idea of decoupling, which doesn't make any sense. They really believe that the economy can keep growing with no more use of resources. So you should look, look at his uh, uh, law. He has a long discussion with the Princeton economist in there that he is. Uh, can you explain that idea? What is decoupling? Yeah. I'm okay, decoupling is the idea that, okay, they use the fact, what, is, what these economists, we've talked to several of them now, they all have the same thing. They have the same thing. You could have more and more like virtual realities that you pay for or fine art that you can actually not have to keep having more stuff and more energy use, and yet the economy can grow as more and more things are not based on real energy. 
and Tom Murphy and I would say that doesn't make any sense because I imagine people buying you know, uh, fine art, Picasso sitting in a sweltering hut. You know, I don't think so. You know, they're going to want air conditioning. Right? So, but anyway, but you, know, I have, you have to find there are a few. They're called ecological communists. There's a few subclass of communists that are actually trying to do this, but the majority of them really, really, really believe that infinite exponential growth in the economy is possible. And this is underlying our economic system. So we, we, we should talk. We're actually trying to invest in it. So I, I, I hate to add to this, but I will. <laughs> Listening to Tom Murphy and, and Kim talk about this, you know, Tom makes another argument. He points out that since the 1950s, since the post-war boom in the American and worldwide economy, people perceived that scientists were telling them that their lives would be better in the future, touting all the kinds of, of things that science can do for them. And now we're in a regime where science, scientists are going to be telling people what they can't do. So we're the bad guys. We're gonna, you know, so Tom's message is that we're going to morph into these bad guys. That's going to feed back on our field, potentially. I hate to be mercenary about this, but. Yeah. So we were, instead of saying we're going to give you electricity too cheap to meter, we're going to say shut off your electricity. Who's going to like that message? We might be saying get solar cells. If they become as cheap as the uh, other services, uh, it'll be attractive. Are they going to do it? It's a benefactor to do that right now. No, but the, the growth. Growth. You have to stop the growth. That's what I'm saying. Growth is about value in the economy, not necessarily more consumption. That's the economist's view. In other words, the, the services, services are becoming a bigger and bigger portion of the economy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the actual. But it's not good for the consumer base. So, so that, that's the view, but if you actually, uh, it's great, I'd love to have this conversation more detail because I've never seen a conference and I haven't yet been able to meet because. What you're really saying, you're going to do this for what, what Tom and I like to point out too is if you just take energy, it has increased at about 3% a year since, since about the 1800s. And if you do that for 1,200 years, then we're using more energy than the entire Milky Way is going now. Exponential growth goes to that. Even before that, in just a couple hundred years, the thermodynamics means that you become as hot as the surface of the sun before that happens. And so, so it's clear that the exponential growth that everyone's predicated on the last 200 years has to end. So the problem is now we try to keep the growth of the GDP going and not the energy growth. You're imagining that it's already happening in Western Europe. It's, it's actually not. Our energy growth is still going up. And to this day, at that, that percentage, it hasn't changed a bit. Um, what we have to imagine is that more and more stuff is the, the non-physical stuff has to become a smaller and smaller fraction. So it actually eventually has to be like you know, a thousandth of a percent of what you're spending money on has no energy cost at all. So you really have to put yourself in the mindset of the person who's buying a, you know, a million dollar Picasso, has millions of dollars to buy a Picasso, and will sit in a sweltering heat without air conditioning in a little hut. Well, that's a separate because uh, putting a ceiling on global growth means billions will be imposed. Remain in poverty. So that, that's not going to be a, an easy message to get across. Right. So, so it seems to me that on the time scales of interest, that this is at some level fundamentally an evolutionary question. It's a yeah. biological question about adapting and built itself. Right. It looks yeah. a lot. Of so there are some, I mean, the crocodile, for instance, has not evolved significantly. Some time scale that I can't remember. But it's 116 million years. Yeah, it's 100 million years. So there are examples of species that have managed to remain relatively unchanged on long time scale. I don't understand why you're invoking biological evolution when I see this primarily as an economic problem. Cultural evolution. Yeah, Cultural so maybe, evolution. Maybe, I, maybe I meant it only in the sense of it's a matter of properly adapting. It may not be biological, maybe just, more cultural. I hope your pension is there. Maybe more Seri I'm, I'm talking seriously. Okay. I hope you have a pension. And, and, and will you be able to adopt, gra adapt gradually if you don't have a pension? I'd like to see people adapting gradually and gracefully to the disappearance of pensions. Or 
dealing with that now. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to become more widespread. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wonder, Sandy, that if on the time scale of a billion years, given all of the problems that everybody's talked about, is the only possible solution that we figure out how to travel to other stars and to harness energy in other ways. I mean, is that, I mean, I realize that 10 to the 13 million is a big number. But I mean, at some point, we are going to be limited by something. But why do you think it's our destiny? I don't think it's our destiny. I'm just saying maybe that's the only possible way out. Otherwise, we're doomed to failure. So Tom Murphy has a whole blog about that. Oh, very is, yeah. is it possible or no. is it no. So that's that's not sustainable? That's okay. The energy to go to other stars, just take energy. And it also, it's like if you have a jar of bacteria that's doubling every you know, minute, but it's halfway full, you know, you've got one minute left, right? It's exponential. Now, suppose, OK, I'll get another jar. I'll give you one more minute. You know, I'll get four more drugs in case you one more minute. So the problem is exponential growth leads it's out. It doesn't mean we're not going to the stars, it means that it's not going to solve the problem. We have to solve the problem somewhere. Else. I mean, is the fact that we haven't been visited mean that we're just doomed? It just, I mean, when you think about what's easier, like to, to use less, you know, to figure out a way to use less, and then versus to figure out a way to travel to another I, I agree. I'm just saying, yeah, given the I argument think, about human nature. I know, it's good. Biological it's impulses of the majority of the species are so antithetical to use less. I mean, I'm not saying what knowledge. should happen or what would be good if it happened. I'm saying it's been on. I was going to piggyback on that. I was at SETICON right before coming down here, and this was a huge part of that convention, that this question about are we going to go to the stars because we're running out of resources and we need to become a multi-planet species and all that. And um, one of the things that was interesting was about, I think this Jill Charter mentioned this, I don't know if you were in this talk, Lisa, but um, about you know if, a, if an alien civilization has evolved to last long enough over millions of years for a civilization, not just life forms itself, but society, to be able to, for us to find them, or for them to find us. They have to have had outgrown violence or aggression to have lasted that long to propagate as a species. And, you know, is that possible for humans, too? Um, you know, to, to someday out-evolve our natural proclivity for conquest and violence, which has been the driver of all evolution, you could argue, and Richard Dawkins has argued this, that evolution has been driven by, you know, violence, or that's been a major part of it. Um, yeah, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, the, these are fun, fundamental questions to ask, I guess. Well, I think when you consider that a billion years ago, the only form of life on Earth was blue and algae, it's not clear what will be there in another billion years. I think the only thing I would bet on would be that there would be some form of life on planet Earth. I think it would be very hard to get rid of all the life. It's very, very hard, hard to do that. It's a thousand-year problem. I think it's not clear. Several hundred years. 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 Several hundred Okay, so I, I was really throwing out this problem to trigger the question in your minds. If you could design an intelligent species that is thriving in some sense, according to your definition of thriving, because I, I actually think we can do bioengineering. I'm, I'm assuming that we could get rid of these annoying, historic, violent, combative, tendencies that love to grow and love to kill, etc. I, I think we could probably have a life form. The question is an intelligent life form. Would you want to live? Would you want to be that person? What does that person do? That's really the, the central core issue for me. What is a life well lived on a planet like that? I can only think of one value that all human beings share. And that is the love of Beyond that, I think it's the problem. That's, that's the problem. One, one child is not because you want to have the right. <laughs> what I want. And you touched on this, but I, I felt you didn't elaborate as much as I thought you were going to. That it's sort of a juxtaposition where the 
know, we have Hubble now. We have these great telescope resources now because we're at this peak of sort of expenditure. I mean, you as a scientist who, you know, enjoy this so much. Feel, you know, feel guilty as hell. Yeah, I mean, and then what's, what do you think is the right thing to do? Is it, is the idea, is the, is the, is the perfect story arc, we get to a pinnacle where you can do this stuff, we discover our place in the universe, and then immediately change our ways and <coughs> turn inward? Or, I mean, I don't know what you're... This is, this is the, thank you for stating the dilemma. I'm glad you, you, you've done it better than I did. That's exactly my point. What is discovery? Since we love really discovery, I mean, somebody mentioned killing, but it seems to me that discovery is as much as our, part of our genome as, as anything else. How, how do we continue to discover when we discover the entire planet and aren't allowed to use any more resources? I do the following calculation. I just picked a number out of nowhere. Um, what, what might be a safe level of people that you could imagine um, not following the environment over a very long period of time? I just picked some statistics. I, I came up with 1% roughly of what we have now. Um, it, it's, it's sort of the order of the state of California. So what is, a, what is the human population able to achieve? What is the nature of life when you are a member of the species and there are 30 to 50 million of you? That's, by the way, about the population of the world in ancient Rome. Well, they were doing good things. You know. Can we find our way? Something that is discovered these days that doesn't take resources. Well, I, I would again just to turn to chemistry. Uh, of course, there's plenty of terrible things going on uh, that are chemical in nature, but I. I you, you, you don't think forefront chemistry exists at the top of the technological pyramid? I'm sorry. Forefront chemistry. I am not sure what you mean. I don't think that. But you could building bigger instruments. Or yeah. No, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, people developing catalysts that will. Think of all the lab equipment that they're using. They're like astronomers. They need they need the miracle of modern technology in order to do their thing. I'm not going to do chemistry in a hut. Whenever we hire a new chemist in the department, it's always a lot more expensive than hiring a new astronomer. One of the reasons we get to hire so many astronomers. Well, the chemists are actually producing a product. Absolutely. Well, there are more efficient ways to. We agree with that. Not only that, there's a less product. Less product. Is the problem. Problem. A more efficient way to use more resources. Right, exactly. Or <laughs> to, to sustain what you have right now. Um, right, the level, this don't level of growth. And don't use up more resources. Um, okay, maybe you um, should wish everybody well. Let's, let's thank Sandy for...